Welcome, everyone. It is with great pleasure I introduce one of our own alumni, alum, make, uh, Tegan White. Since graduating in 2012, Tegan has built a career as a freelance illustrator and artist. Inspired by folk art and the natural world, her aesthetic is rich with meticulous details. She is equally adept at illustrating a playful children's book populated with adorable animal characters or painting the ephemeral beauty of decomposing organic matter. Her projects range from children's picture books to book covers, pattern and surface, design that has been applied to everything from the obvious totes, mugs, and clothing to home products and wall clocks. She is noted for her signature blending of typography and illustration. A few noteworthy clients include Target, Nike, Honda, Ford, Penguin Random House, Disney Hyperium, Patagonia, and Wired Magazine. So please join me in welcoming Tegan White. I haven't tried this yet. Can you hear me? Cool. Okay. Hey, I'm Tegan. Thanks for coming. Um, so I am a full-time freelance illustrator and artist, as you heard. Um, I went to MCAD from 2008 to 2012 um, for my illustration undergrad. And I started taking illustration jobs while I was in school, and I've been fully self-employed ever since. I currently specialize mainly in children's books and gallery work, um, and also selling prints and products. But I've worked in pretty much every part of the illustration industry, editorial, advertising, product patterns, greeting cards, you name it. Um, one of the things that's made it easy for me to cover so much ground and work in so many different industries over the years um, is that I work in two vastly different styles. So one of them is very uh, detailed and naturalistic. I paint a lot of plants and animals and dead things, basically, um, or soon-to-be dead animals, uh, surrounded by flowers, and that's kind of what I'm all about. I try to make things that, at a glance, um, maybe come off as just pretty, um, but on a deeper level, I am exploring morbid ideas about life cycles um, and death and chaos and discord, but trying to present them in a way that um, still feels pretty. I want to confront my viewer with um, the reality of death and challenge them to examine their own relationship with it and how they might contribute to things like animal death and habitat destruction and uh, other things that are critical for the natural world. So unlike maybe a more conventional illustrator, I do have a message behind my work that I'm trying to get out there. And uh, so I do end up crossing over with fine art in a lot of ways. The longer I've been working, the more my focus has shifted away from freelance work and doing more gallery work um, and selling prints because those things allow me to deal with some of these concepts in a more kind of overt way. But I'm also still very much a practicing illustrator. Um, in my realistic style, I've done things like book covers, uh, magazine articles, packaging, posters for bands and movies. Um, but as often as I can, I prefer lately to do gallery pieces. Um, these are a few paintings from my most recent two-person art show in Portland. And then I have a totally different style for my children's illustration, which is a lot like having a totally separate art career. Um, and again, that's one of the things that's made it uh, easier for me to make a living as an illustrator, especially when I was first starting out, is being able to kind of draw on the work of two different people. Um, so in this style, I do mainly cute animal critters, uh, doing cute things outside, uh, exploring, playing. Um, and I actually recently just created a separate social media account um, to kind of like keep my two styles separate because it felt like they're like maybe they exist in such different worlds. And I thought that maybe, uh, you know, parents don't want their kids looking at like dead animals and stuff. So um, my, uh, my work for kids is uh, now newly under the name Tiny Moth Studios. Um, so in this work, I'm still interested in a lot of the same themes that I explore in my realistic work. Um, I, I think a lot about helping people connect with nature or feel respect towards it. It's just 
uh, obviously a really different audience because it's kids. So the approach is really different. Um, so here I'm trying to help kids identify with animals, uh, feel at home outdoors, foster creativity and cooperation and teamwork, and just you know kind of encourage them to play outside and explore their surroundings. So I've written two picture books myself so far. Um, they're an alphabet book and a counting book. And uh, they follow a cast of animal critters as they find fun things to do outdoors. Here's an example of one of the interior pages. And then I've also worked with publishers to illustrate manuscripts by other authors. Um, I've illustrated a total of six picture books now. Um, two of them are coming out in the next year. Um, but children's illustration doesn't have to just be picture books. Um, I think a lot of people are really, really great at picture books and they kind of stop there with it. But um, I've always explored kind of other avenues of um, making freelance work with my children's illustration style. So I do tons of other stuff like um, book covers for kids, magazines, puzzles, toys, greeting cards, stationery. Um, these are uh, greeting cards for papyrus and uh, some Halloween cards that are actually out at Target right now. And I've also done um, patterns and textiles. These are some quilting fabrics. And uh, occasionally I've gotten the opportunity to do really fun things like games and puzzles. So this is actually like a giant, giant tree puzzle that you can like lay out on the floor and all the pieces are double-sided and interchangeable. Um, so now that you have a feeling for what my work kind of looks like um, and the different types of projects that I've worked on, I want to talk a little bit about how I got from point A to point B because I figure that that's pretty relevant to most of you right now and kind of the sort of thing you're trying to do. Um, and so just for fun and so I can feel really embarrassed about myself um, and you can all laugh at me, I'm going to go way, 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 way back and show you work from when I was like 16 and all I drew was anime and I've never <laughs> shown this to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so this is some of my weird emo anime art. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> uh, honestly, it was like a really, really good thing to get into at the time because it taught me like everything I know about Photoshop and a lot about color and uh, shading and line and just composition and all kinds of things. Um, when I got a little bit older, uh, I discovered the idea of graphic design through a class it, that I was lucky enough to have at my high school. Um, and I got really obsessed with typography, and I started like making my own fonts, which were really ugly, and redesigning uh, the packaging for my favorite CDs, um, which was mostly all Bright Eyes CDs. Um, and so I, I moved away from anime at that point and really focused on the graphic design stuff, but I do owe a lot of my earliest development to the work that I was doing back in high school. So when I got to MCAD, I planned on majoring in graphic design, but I quickly realized that I just really, really liked drawing too much and that I wasn't getting to do enough of that in my graphic design classes. Um, I didn't really understand what illustration was, even though I was kind of doing it in my free time. I just, it just didn't click for me. So I declared my major uh, as illustration sort of as a middle ground between graphic design and fine art. Uh, I was definitely afraid of drawing humans or characters uh, for years um, because I knew that the anime influence would creep in. I like hadn't discovered like a different way of drawing people. Um, so I defaulted to animals and natures as my main subject matter right away and, uh, and also started playing around more with like typography in an illustrated sense. And honestly, I really kind of hated illustration at first. Um, I did my best. Uh, I tried everything, every medium, every style. And um, even if I uh, got good grades or fulfilled the requirements of an assignment, nothing ever really felt right to me. Um, I think I had like an abstract idea in my head of like what illustration was supposed to be or supposed to look like um, or what I thought that an assignment required or what an instructor expected of me. Um, and so I think that my work at that time was kind of coming out as kind of like generic and forced, and it just like never felt like me. I was learning a lot while I was doing it, but it wasn't quite right. Um, so in the meantime, I was taking as many fine art classes as I could, because in those classes, I felt like I was able to explore whatever concepts I wanted. Um, it was more about like what you were doing with your technique or the materials, and uh, you weren't really dictated in terms of um, uh, like a brief or um, 
like an imaginary assignment or project from a client. Um, so I made giant charcoal drawings and weird artist books made from handmade paper, and it all focused on um, decay and life cycles and seasons. And even though this doesn't really look anything like the work that I do now, it was the first time that I started to feel like passionate about what I was creating, and the work started to feel like um, like it was unique and like it was my own, and like it was coming from me and not from what I expected any what I thought anyone expected from me. Um, so finally, in my f last year at school, some of my instructors were finally able to convince me that I could like bring some of those same sorts of ideas and concepts into my illustration assignments. Um, it was almost like I needed explicit permission from them to realize there wasn't like a right answer for every assignment, um, and that it was more about interpreting and, or like twisting the brief even, um, however I could to make it something that was exciting to me and that fit my style and my goals. And honestly, I think that that's the most important skill I ever learned in school and when I still use every day as an illustrator, uh, like the ability to prioritize your own vision and find a way to um, make work for the project that fulfills the needs of the project, but that also fulfills your needs as a creative person. Um, ironically, I had to kind of go through a form of that realization all over again when it came to client work. Um, so I had actually been doing freelance illustration uh, work here and there since high school. Um, not like anything good. I had just been posting art online consistently since I was like 14. And I think that no matter what your work looks like, if it's out there online, you're kind of going to get someone coming to you asking you to make like a logo or some album artwork or something like that. So I was doing odd jobs like that all through college. Um, and that was fine because I was like finding my style at the time. And I was also learning bits and pieces about how to talk to clients how to write contracts and invoices, how to promote myself, um, so that by the time I graduated, I was beginning to get some jobs with bigger companies and publications, like um, this is stuff for Wired Magazine and for Nike. Um, what I really want to point out about these projects, though, is that although they were great in that I was able to work professionally and develop a client list and make money off of the work, at this stage, all of my clients were only coming to me because I could do illustrated typography or because I could draw realistically and accurately. Absolutely no one was like deeply invested or interested in like my creative vision, um, my personal sense of aesthetics, or what concepts I wanted to explore in my work. No one was saying, hey, can you make us work about animal decay? <laughs> um, and partly that's just the nature of being an illustrator, right? And that's not really a problem. Like, that's what you sign up for, is making work for other people and accepting um, what they want you to make. Um, and so at first, I was really happy doing that. I enjoyed it. I uh, Mostly when I thought of it as a, like a job to make money or a fun opportunity to problem solve or to try something new that I hadn't done before. But I also want to point out that, like, the work that you're most passionate about might not necessarily be the same work that's useful and practical like out in the real world um, to potential clients. And so it's kind of about striking a balance or um, making some sacrifices to make ends meet. So while I was doing this work, I was also trying to find as much time as I could to do some personal work and gallery pieces and things like that um, so that I wasn't just only making work that was what other people asked of me. Um, so while it's important to be flexible and grateful for the work that you're able to get, um, and I was, uh, I think it's also really, really important to like be able to step back once in a while and look at what you're doing at any stage in your career or your you know time at school, like where you are now, where you're going to be in 10 years, um, and ask yourself, am I on the right track? Uh, like, is this the path I'm supposed to be following, or would I be happier if I went and did something else? So after a couple years of freelance, I was feeling my star my, myself start to get like really creatively frustrated um, and actually starting to actually feel resentful towards my art directors or um, the like revisions that I was being asked to do because that's a really big part of being an illustrator too is um, making something that you think looks good and then having someone say, oh, this is cool, but can we change this, this, and this until it's something that you don't like anymore? <laughs> 
Um, so at the time, I was doing a lot of high-paying advertising work for big companies. And it was the sort of work that felt almost ridiculous to turn down. Like, uh, it paid so well, and it was for, like, such recognizable companies that, you know, your parents would be excited to hear that you got a job working for that company or whatever. Um, but I was starting to feel, like, kind of disgusted with myself for, like, making art to sell cars and other things that I didn't even think should exist in the world. <laughs> Um, and, I, and then I also had some projects where I made weird banana characters with anime faces. Um, <laughs> I don't, they, they like threw money at me and so I did these 26 horribly ugly illustrations of fruit and vegetable characters with anime faces and it was really horrible. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I got to a point where I was like, I have to be a lot stricter with myself about the type of work I do. Um, I mean, at the same time, I wasn't, you know, no one except for you guys and maybe like one other talk that I've given has seen Banana Character Guy. Um, <laughs> because I didn't put that in my portfolio. You know, I didn't put it on Instagram. It wasn't work that I was showing people. Um, and that's a lot of, I mean, anyone I know who's an illustrator does stuff like that. They, they show you their best work, but it's not all the work that they're doing. Um, it's not like glamorous and exciting all of the time. There's stuff that you just have to do to kind of get by. Um, or even stuff that you think you accepted the job thinking that it will turn out as like something you're going to put in your portfolio, but it just kind of like goes a little bit south at some point and you're like, maybe I'm not going to actually show this to anyone. And so that happens all the time. Um, and so it was at that stage that I realized that I really needed to start transitioning away from advertising and other client work that I hated. Um, and what allowed me to make that trans transition was that I hadn't stopped doing personal work over the years. Um, I hadn't stopped doing work that was about dead animals and about decay and thinking about those ideas and exploring that subject matter. So while I was doing all kinds of freelance projects, I also made time to participate in group shows or uh, like improve my children's illustration style. Um, and uh, the more of this work I posted instead of like the weird job that I was doing, the less people asked me to do like a bunch of typography and the more I was able to um, get clients asking me to do this type of thing. Um, but even now at this point, like after doing it for a lot of years, um, there is still a huge trade off between like my client work and my personal work. When it comes down to it, there's just not that huge of a market for people to hire me to draw dead animals all the time. Um, or like even just work that's maybe quite as morbid as I would like to do. Um, so it's true that like a lot of my, it's still true that a lot of my client work is like more straightforward nature illustration. Um, and people just coming to me because they're like, hey, you can draw a bird. But I think the difference now is that um, me being clear and consistent online about my subject matter and my ethics that I prefer to like stick to, I've been able to move away from things like car ads and more towards things uh, that have a focus on education or conservation and other things that are important to me. Um, same with uh, children's illustration. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know why that slides there. <laughs> um, but uh, the most important thing about making time for personal work is that it has kind of given me access to a whole different part of the illustration world that I didn't know existed while I was in school. So when I graduated, I really thought that I would have to always get by as a freelancer um, and just always be kind of searching for that next job or that next client um, and that that would kind of consume my life. Um, but after a few years of doing this, I discovered that it would be possible to basically work for myself and just by making uh, art pieces, prints, and products that people would want to buy from me directly. So in the past year or so, I've started self-releasing limited edition prints, um, making things like enamel pins, postcards, patches, zines, uh, anything else that I just think should exist in the world and that I want to make. Um, I'm really lucky and grateful to have enough of an online following at this point that that's possible for me. Um, but uh, the reason that I bring it up is I think that it's like important to keep in mind that whatever you're excited about, whatever things that like, I mean, think about the things that you buy when you go online or that you look at on Instagram, like you can make those things too. Like 
if you think that something is really cool and you're excited and want to make it, then chances are that there's someone out there who's going to think that it's really cool too and will want to buy it and give you money for it to happen. Um, and uh, like it doesn't happen all at once. Like as you can see, like it took me a long time of doing other work on the side before I was able to get to that point. But I really believe that like whatever your work looks like, even if it's super weird, um, like there is a niche for it. There is people who will be really, really excited about that stuff too. And it's just a matter of finding them. And so like the sooner you can start putting your stuff, your stuff out there, uh, even if you're not sure what your vision is yet or whatever, um, the more time you're giving yourself for those people to find your work. I think I see a lot of people who, you know, they're doing something really cool, but they put it online. And if they don't like get a huge response right away, they get really discouraged. Um, and then they just stop posting and that's the worst thing you can do. Like it's never going to be really great immediately and you kind of have to give yourself a little bit of time to, um, for the people who your work will speak to, to find it because they're just not going to find it right away. Um, so I also do a lot of things that are like weird and kind of on the side and different from freelance work. Um, I'm currently starting up a collaborative brand with my friend and fellow illustrator Erica Williams. Um, where we focus more on like occult themed products and apparel type releases. Um, so like with that and with all of the products that I've been making, I'm hoping that within a year or so, I just really won't be doing any more freelance work at all um, and mainly just doing self-directed projects. I'm also in a similar transition period with my children's illustrations. Um, I'm not quite as enthusiastic about illustrating manuscripts by other authors are following the type brief as I am about like writing my own picture books. So I've been focusing more on writing my own stories, um, creating more of my own characters um, so that that side of my practice can be a little bit more independent as well. So I think that's been like kind of an easier realization because I went through like so many years of kind of messing up with my realistic work. Um, so now that we've gone from point A, emo, anime, art, and banana people, to point B, whatever I'm doing now, um, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what motivates me to make work at all. Um, so as I'm sure you've noticed by now, my work is focused almost exclusively on nature, and my life is the same way. Um, so I'm going to gush about nature for a while. <laughs> Um, other than making art, all I've ever really wanted to do is be outdoors, um, exploring or camping or canoeing or looking at an animal or sitting by the side of a creek. Um, when I was at, when I was younger and when I was a kid, I definitely in, like liked animals. Um, but it wasn't until I moved to Minneapolis that I started actively engaging with nature um, and going on adventures to swamps and cliff sides and the North Shore and the Boundary Waters. Um, and those firsthand experiences and noticing all of the tiny details took me from making work that was um, just kind of like a generic abstract idea of nature and it made it um, more focused and passionate and specific and so that, that I was excited about making the work and the work became better because I would come back from an adventure just like bursting with all of this stuff and I just wanted to share it with the world. Um, part of my motivation for making work is also to try to influence the way that others think about or engage with nature, um, which is maybe kind of a lofty goal, but um, it's just something I feel strongly about. Uh, many of the places that I love and the animals that I appreciate so much are threatened, whether it's by companies that ravage them or a government that doesn't care to protect them or just ordinary good people who like ignore the environmental consequences, consequences of their daily actions. Um, so it's my constant hope that in even just a really small way, I can inspire like a little bit of like awe or respect for nature um, and my viewers, not just for like fantastic and exotic places, but just for like the tiny pockets of nature all around us. I like to paint a lot of things like squirrels and songbirds and uh, animals that are just like around us all the time or that we consider to be pests um, because that's just what's around me every day. And I can find delight in that, even if it's not really kind of like amazing and noteworthy. Um, but no matter how beautiful natural places are, you also can't explore them very much without coming across death as well. 
so I come across animal remains so often in the wild, and it's, I think, one of the most, like, impactful experiences that I've had in my life, no matter how many times it happens. Um, it's kind of, like, beautiful and confusing and gross and sad and weird. Um, intellectually, I know that it's natural and essential for things to die, and I'm happy for them to break down and nourish future life. Um, but there's still always a feeling of tragedy and maybe like a faint eeriness uh, attached to each experience of finding a dead thing. And that's something that I can never shake. And having like this weird, like implacable, uh, really complicated feeling is one of the main things that drives me to make art at all. So I've buried lots and lots and lots of animals. It's just a thing that I do. And I've also painted lots and lots and lots and lots of dead animals, which is also a thing I do. Um, and I know I'll probably keep painting them forever in all kinds of different iterations because to me it feels like no individual painting ever gets close enough to like describing like the nuance or complexity of the actual experience of, experience of finding it. Um, and so I just feel like compelled to keep trying again and again until I get it right, um, even if I don't think that one painting can ever like fully get it right. Um, and I also know for sure that I wouldn't have been able to make this deep connection with ex or like keep exploring and coming back to the same subject matter again and again if I was just brainstorming these ideas in my studio. Going out into the natural world has been like crucial to me. Um, engaging with this subject matter, and uh, it kind of it really took my work from the point where I was just drawing animals to draw something um, to the point where I was really passionate about it. Um, there's also a way that exploring nature is much less morbid than all of that. Um, at least half of what you do, or at least I do, when I go out into nature, is just like playing. Um, it's like having an adventure, and it's like putting the pressures of life on hold so that uh, you can just enjoy things and engage with your surroundings in a new way, like building boats out of twigs and bark. Or talking to an animal and wondering why it does the weird animal things that it does that you'll never quite relate to. Uh, there's a lightheartedness and a love for cute things and storytelling, and a, also kind of like a desire to turn the cruelty of nature into like a comforting narrative. And uh, that's just as valid of a part about how I experience nature um, as the morbid stuff. And uh, it's just like a different side of my personality that uh, comes out in my children's illustration. So for me, it's always been really important that I'm able to express all sides of my personality somehow through my art. Um, and in my realistic work, there was like never a place for like silliness and absurdity and childlike delight. Um, all of which are just like core parts of who I am. And so I don't think that I felt really complete as an artist until I had an outlet to express those things and I'd kind of come up with this uh, second, totally different style. So now I have all these goofy characters uh, to explore the world the same way that I do um, and do the same types of activities that I do or wish I could do. Um, for example, here is one of the squirrels that sits on my windowsill all day eating food from the dumpster out back. Um, here he's eating like a weird ham sandwich, <laughs> but usually it's pizza or avocados. He likes to just show me whatever he has. <laughs> and so I made an enamel pin about him. Because <laughs> I do what I want. Another thing that's really, really important to me is finding a way to make, wor make the world a little bit, tiny bit better through my career. Um, it can feel really self-indulgent to just sit at home making art all day about like my own experiences and feelings and pizza squirrels. So I'm, I've been trying to be more vocal online about like actual environmental or conservation issues. Um, I currently volunteer at a wildlife rehabilitation center once a week. And that's really lovely because I get to go and nurse young and injured birds back to health. Um, you basically just shove mealworms down their throats. Um, but uh, that has like really deepened my commitment to protecting wildlife even more. Um, and I think made it uh, made, made some of my work a lot more personal. Um, I've also uh, 
for most of this year, I've been donating like a portion of my print le releases to like social or charitable or environmental causes. Um, I know that like me and myself can only like raise a, like really small amounts of money that probably don't help that much. But uh, the more important thing is like just being vocal and talking about this stuff and raising awareness. I feel like because I have a large following online, um, I feel like it's like the bare minimum that I can do uh, to just be like really clear um, to anyone who's like looking uh, about the type of world that I think that we should be trying to create. Um, and so I just like hope that there's a few people that I can influence in some small way. Um, making my work more overtly political or like crossing over into outright activism is one thing that I'm kind of struggling with and trying to be better about. I think the artists that I admire most tend to have some sort of uh, greater message behind their work. Um, this is work by Brazilian painter Jao Ruas, um, and he's my absolute favorite artist from an aesthetic standpoint. But also many of his pieces seem to kind of depict the pointlessness of war um, and like the tragedy that it leaves in its wake. One of the things I admire most in any, of bo any body of work is when an artist is able to kind of create their own sort of mythos um, or like a visual or symbolic uh, language that's totally unique to them that you won't see replicated in anyone else's work. Um, and I think that he's one of the most successful examples of doing that. Another big inspiration is Detroit-based illustrator, muralist, and street artist, Pat Perry. Um, he's the person I look up to most in terms of like his really seamless integration of art and activism. He addresses like really specific and crucial topics um, in his mural work and uh, even like editorial work, like the refugee crisis, oil pipelines, indigenous rights, conservation. Um, but also in like a more broad way, he critiques the way that we live our lives or engage with each other. Um, and challenges oppressive systems and mindsets. So like for me, when I look at his work, I just wanna like burn all of my possessions and run away somewhere and do something more useful than whatever I'm doing right now. Um, but I haven't decided what that is yet. Uh, for my children's illustration, Carson Ellis and Rebecca Green are two of my biggest inspirations. And I'm also super into zines and poetry and sketchbooks and anything that's very rough or loose or includes like a written or poetic component. Um, I completely adore any work that manages to be like sloppy and like cool or beautiful at the same time because that's something that I'm not capable of. Like I'm always like I work very, very tightly and I can't seem to kind of like loosen up and still make something that I like. Uh, so I actually find it much more impressive to see a really kind of loose work um, than work that's super tightly rendered. So here's a small portion of my giant zine collection and also my tiny cat collection. Um, content wise, also many of the ideas for my paintings are directly inspired by witchcraft and the occult. I practice tarot, astrology, um, other forms of divination. I celebrate pagan holidays and uh, the cool thing is that everything in paganism is intertwined with the earth and seasons and phases of the moon and it kind of just goes along with everything that is natural. Uh, so it, I pull a lot of themes and symbols from those studies and it just feels like a really natural pairing for you know, making work about plants and animals. So these things usually come through in like a really, really subtle way in my work um, and they're probably not apparent at a glance, which is totally fine. Um, but I do plan on eventually like making my own tarot deck and uh, dealing with some of the stuff in a more overt way. Um, so the last thing I'm going to summarize is my process. So I'm gonna go through everything from like ideation and sketching to um, like creating the work and to how I go about branding and promoting myself. Um, so I'm gonna use this piece as an example. So this is the finish thing. Um, and the very first thing that I do before I like even know exactly what I'm gonna make, um, this piece that I'm gonna be talking about is like a gallery piece. So it's just, you know, whatever I felt like making, like the sky is the limit kind of thing. Um, I like to start with like a really kind of like vague general idea of just like, color and like scale and I'll just have like a really, really abstract idea in my head of like 
maybe I knew that there was going to be a fox in it, and so it would be orange, but like that also like these pinks and soft grays and stuff like that were going to come into it. And so I'll just kind of like browse online and like make a Pinterest board or whatever and like uh, just save anything that I think is cool. Um, And it's not to use any of this as direct reference. It's more to kind of like solidify for myself the idea of what I'm going to make so that I can come back to this board later. Um, Because oftentimes uh, if it's something like a gallery show, like I might have the idea for the work like six months before I can actually sit down and start working on it. And so I don't want that idea to go away and a sketch won't really summarize it in quite the same way. So it's kind of like the idea of creating a mood board so I can like come back to this and be like, oh yeah, that's what I was thinking for that work once I actually sit down and start making it. And then the next thing I do is the stupidest, crappiest sketch in the whole world that doesn't look like anything. Um, And this is what my very first sketches always look like. Um, So this is for four different pieces, and the second one is the fox. He has a weird mouth. And I'll kind of solidify, like, maybe a tighter color palette and um, just some, like, I don't know. This is just, like, something that I would, like, have up on my screen while I'm working just to kind of, like, keep me cued into the aesthetic. And then... Before I do any kind of tighter sketches, it's really important for me to do a ton, a ton, a ton of visual research. So I will usually just like make a folder with just tons and tons and tons and tons of reference images. Um, So I might save like 200 photos of foxes from Google. And when I'm saving these photos, I'll be looking for everything from like how their fur looks to like I know that its mouth is going to be open, so I need to see what its teeth look like to um, what do its nails look like because you uh, oftentimes can't even like see their hands in photos and how their body moves and all kinds of stuff. Um, I would love to always use my own references, but unfortunately I don't have just like random foxes and rabbits on hand, although I would like to. Um, and so it's, it's really important for me to go through this whole process. And what I'll do from there is actually like look through all of them and uh, find some ones that I can specifically use as reference. So like like the mouth that I mentioned, um, the mouth of this fox is pretty similar to the one that I actually ended up drawing. Um, the topmost one there was more one that I like kept on my screen because I liked the coloring and the way that its fur moved. Um, the one on the right is um, more for like facial reference. And so I'll have like all kinds of these and I'll kind of be able to like from all these references sort of collage together like a Frankenstein animal, um, either in my head or even in Photoshop that I can use as a reference. And that way I'm not relying on like copying one person's photo or or on like needing to know exactly what how the anatomy of a fox works. Um, So that just really helps me. And then from there I'll create what to me is, I guess, a loose sketch, but um, this is what I'll eventually transfer onto my final paper, and it's really important for me to put color in so that I know like where to start once I actually start painting. Um, so there are intermediate stages. I, for some reason, I don't have them for, I like deleted my PSD um, for my Fox illustration, but I have an example of like how my sketches come about from a different piece. So I'll start like really, really loose, add some really loose color, and then like kind of lower the opacity. I always sketch in Photoshop um, and kind of just build up the details from there. So like loose flowers to tight flowers, weird notes to myself. And I'm always least certain about color, um, even though I do lots of preliminary stuff in terms of like picking my color palette. Um, But I'll usually have to like save out like a bunch of different color options and look at them all and get really stressed and angry about which one's going to be perfect and ask all my friends which color palette they like and then disregard all of their opinions. <laughs> um, and then this is sketch to final. Uh, so back to Fox Guy. Um, I paint um, almost exclusively in watercolor and gouache. Um, I use a acrylic-based gouache. Um, and I generally start with uh, like lighter washes of color first, um, warmer, lighter colors, uh, usually in watercolor. And I'll do like kind of the areas that I want to be loose and have watercolor texture first. And then from there, I will start tightening up the warm colors and the light colors and gradually get darker and darker. 
um, and tighter and tighter as I go. And so the most like dark or opaque or uh, like vibrantly colored or solid areas are the areas that I do with gouache. There's a photo of the finished and the final painting again. And so even though my children's illustration style is like super different, it's usually basically the same process. Um, I, and actually I do this with my gallery work too. I tend to work on multiple paintings at the same time. Um, and this is mainly because I'm super busy and it's a time saver um, because I will just like mix all of the gray at once and then paint like six different sheets with the gray color um, and then mix the yellow and paint all the sheets with the yellow. Um, so usually my desk looks something like this at some point with just like, you know, six or eight different uh, paintings in progress that I'll just have warm colors so far or whatever. Um, and it also, for picture books, it really, really helps to, uh, in terms of page to page consistency. But the sketching process is the same too. Um, I'll do a really, really tight sketch. Uh, and this, uh, I should say that like, you know, if you're interested in like children's books or working with clients, I don't think anyone really expects you to do a sketch this like tight. Um, my editors are always like, wow, this looks like final art. Um, but I, I actually, I don't really do it for them so that they can see everything in place. It's really for me because I need to have this as a guide when I start painting. Otherwise, I'll mess up. I need to know exactly where every single color goes because watercolor is a pretty unforgiving medium. So this is the final. And yeah, they look pretty much the same. Um, and then I also want to talk about like process once you're done with the thing that you're making, um, because that's something that I think about just as much, if not more. It's, for me, it's kind of like, you know, making work is fun and I can just sit there and do it, but it's really exciting to get to share it with people and to make it look as good as it can. So for things like that, I'm thinking about like, you know, getting high quality prints made. I'm thinking about how I'm framing the work. I'm thinking about taking nice photographs um, of the paintings or the products or whatever it is, uh, having thoughtful packaging for anything that I'm shipping out. I even think about like things like what order I post stuff on Instagram and like how it will all look together like as like a curated page, um, you know, how the colors will play off of each other and stuff like that. Um, because that impacts like what someone thinks when they like come to your page or your website or whatever and see it um, like that is a composition in itself too um, and that also kind of determines whether or not I sh feel like I should post anything at all um, and I think that Presentation can be really important, especially if you have like a really simple style that people might not naturally like, if they see like a close up of a flower that you painted, they might not go, wow, that's an amazing flower. But if you're presenting it the right way, even if your style is really simple, um, then they can go like, wow, like look at the way that you like made this look. Um, I can see this as like part of my life or I want that because of the way that you've presented it. So Rifle Paper Co. is a greeting card company that you probably know that um, is, I think really, really great at uh, having really lovely spreads and the really curated Instagram and website. Um, and then there's like the idea that how you take photos of things kind of establishes your brand as well and how people perceive you. So that can be um, like you know, the, the colors that you use as your backdrop or you know maybe you post everything on your Instagram as like black and white because you do a lot of black and white work and there's no color on your Instagram at all you know I'm just using Instagram as an example but um, it can be really important and helpful to think about things like that uh, establishing a brand is not even just about like what you make and the actual art that's coming out but it's also about like what you say about it, um, you know, how you title things, uh, what other aspects of your life you choose to share online or with other people in your life that you meet. Um, and the last point that I wanna make um, is just about, and it kind of goes along with branding, but uh, being true to what you really wanna make and what you wanna do with your life. Um, so, like I was describing to you, like my trials with like freelance and stuff like that, I was able to modify my practice until I had time to do things that I always wanted to do, like make a zine or like just sell a bunch of patches. Um, 
even though I don't really make a lot of money off of things like that, they're just things that I want to put out into the world and I want a reason to be able to share them with people. Um, and they just feel really crucial to my like sense of creative happiness. So I couldn't feel happy and successful right now doing like the advertising work that I had been doing years ago, even though I was decently good at it, even though like I like made decent money doing it. Um, so I cut it out of my portfolio and I've like never like looked back or regretted that in any way. The most frequent question that I get from students and other illustrators is like, how do I find jobs or how do I find clients? And I understand that that's obviously a super important question because you need to eat and you need to pay your bills and you need to do all those things. Um, but I think that it's the wrong question at least to start off with. I think that focusing too much on what other people want or expect from you is only gonna negatively impact what you create. It will make it less original because you're trying to like fit in with whatever else is happening in the industry or it'll take the passion out of it because you don't feel like the thing that you're actually passionate about has a place. Or it'll make you aim lower than your full potential out of fear that uh, you won't be able to meet your biggest goals. I think that everyone should start out rather than asking like, how do I find jobs? Um, and start off with the question instead of like, what do I want my work to be like? And once you've fully explored that and found out what you're actually passionate about, then you can start filling in the blanks of what you wanna do with that work um, to make money and who's gonna pay for it and how you make that successful because there's so many ways and it's not just finding clients. You don't even need to ever have a client um, if you can find, uh, you know, maybe it's a graphic design position, maybe it's um, being a member of a collective or starting your own greeting card line. Like there's all kinds of different avenues and you should be considering all of them, not just the ones that clients will kind of push in your direction. Um, so, and like for me, so like when I tell you that it took me a really long time to get to this point and that I did a bunch of other freelance work along the way. That's not saying that that's going to be exactly your career path either. Um, you might find that that works for you to like get your foot in the door, get your feet off the ground. Um, but no two illustrators have exactly the same career path. I've never met anyone whose career unfolded exactly the way that mine has. And so I can't give anyone the answers of like the best way to promote themselves or like the best clients to go after or anything like that. But what I can tell you from my experience is that I see people being successful when they're so excited about what they're making that the art creeps into like every aspect of their life. Um, those are the people who go out and make friends with other artists and go to events and conventions and apply for workshops and residencies and participate in art shows. Uh, not because they're like naturally talented or gifted necessarily, but because they're just excited about what they're making and they want to keep doing it and it's all that they want to do. Um, and those connections that you gain from talking to artists or going to events or applying to things might lead to jobs and opportunities. Um, or they might teach you about a new way of making money that you didn't know existed. Um, they might like start spark an idea for a project that takes you to the next level or gets you recognized online or in your community. Um, but none of that will happen if you don't like first focus on making the, your work good and putting it out there into the world. And it doesn't mean that it has to be like good right away, but just like starting that process is like super, super key. Um, and it's always going to be like long and frustrating. Um, and, but like in my experience, it was like all about giving myself permission to make the work that I felt passionate about and things didn't start to fall into place until after I did that. So that's all. We have time for questions, I think. Uh, maybe like 10 minutes. Um, yes, in the back. Yeah. Um, the question was whether I had ever posted process videos. Um, I haven't done too much of that. I once did, um, what was that app where you can like live stream? I forget. Yeah, Periscope. <laughs> I did a few of those and they were really, really fun. So I want to do it again. I'm always just like rushing to a deadline. So that's totally on my agenda for things to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, um, the question was how to find clients. Um, and uh, so I've never sought out many of my clients. Um, I've done mainly like promoting myself online and just being like really versatile so that uh, there were a lot of different like options for the work that I could get. Um, but I think that um, some of my best tips for where to start is not to do like free work or offer yourself for free or anything like that. Um, if you don't feel like you're able to charge for uh, any freelance work yet, that's totally fine. But I would encourage you to then like do work for your friends, do work that like you think is cool, do like a you know poster for your friend's band that's playing in a basement, or do like um, volunteer for like an organization that needs some graphic design help that's doing something like ethical that's important to you. Um, do things that like make you actually excited. Don't like you know go on to like Craigslist and search graphic design gigs or whatever and then just like do the first thing that comes along unless those types of gigs are exciting to you, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, um, and, then, and also, you know, doing things like gallery shows or whatever. Um, some of, I, I think like proving that you can do the thing with what you're putting out online is really important. So like if you want to make stationery or fabric or patterns, things like that, then just like do a bunch of them, like do one every day and just post it. Um, things like that catch the attention of clients really easily. And then you have something, if you do want to reach out to a specific client that you think uh, would want to work with you, then you have something to show them to prove that you can actually do the thing that you're contacting them about. And I think that that's really, really important is just like showing that you um, are thinking about these things already and that you're capable of doing the work and that you're like a self-starter um, who's like passionate about the actual content. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the question was um, protecting your work when you post it online in terms of copyright and so forth. Um, The thing is that like, if someone wants to take it, they can. They can find a way for the most part, um, unless you're posting like really, really low res things and like never selling any prints or anything like that. There are tons and tons of knockoffs of my work because people can buy prints and then they can scan them and then they can like just make a print from the scan. Um, or uh, you know, with things like enamel pins, there's a lot of theft because you can just look at the design and you can recreate it and send it to a factory and get it made. So you're never gonna be 100% safe, but honestly, I don't think that that should be anyone's top priority. Like you shouldn't not wanna post things just because someone might steal it, just like you shouldn't wanna like not go outside because someone might grab your bag or something. Um, just like stuff happens. Um, you can always report copyright infringement. And so I would encourage you to think more about like, you know, like pursuing those things rather than, you know, just being like afraid of it happening. Um, because if someone wants to, you know, get a tattoo of your work, if they want to do whatever, like, you can't really stop them, so. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, MCAD was really, really, really great for me. Um, I'm super glad that I went here. Uh, there's not really like any other school that I wish I had gone to instead or anything like that. Um, it's really expensive, you guys know that. It probably could be less expensive, you guys know that. <laughs> but uh, I, I, for me, it was really, really worth it. Um, the difference between like going to a state school would have been having to take all kinds of classes that weren't related to art um, and that and like not having the same like facilities or being surrounded by people who were maybe like as ambitious as me. Um, and also just like the quality of the instructors is really, really great here. Um, so I am super happy that I went to MCAD. Uh, that said, I know tons of self-taught artists and that I think is like totally viable. It's not like you need school to get somewhere. Um, I think the, the difference is maybe not realizing 
not having as much opportunity to explore and experiment, I never would have tried things like paper making or any type of print making or um, like literally the only reason I never would have tried gouache or watercolor if I uh, wasn't forced to in classes. And now that's all that I work in. So I think like it opening you up to experimentation and uh, and also like exposure to the work of your classmates is really, really crucial. Um, and so you can find those things on your own without school. You absolutely can. Um, but are you going to? Are you going to actually push yourself to do all of that? Um, there are people who do, but I think that they're like really, really exceptionally driven. Um, and because that path is just like that much harder. Yep. My favorite character to draw. Um, I guess I have been drawing. Let's see if she's in here. I'm enjoying this little chipmunk. She's really cool because she knows more about camping than me. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, you mean like quantity limits? Um, so that, that's a, the, the question was whether or not um, I've had issues with quantity limits with things like ordering pins and other products. Uh, and that's something that's a real concern, especially like the sky's not the limit in terms of like making the things you, that you want to make, especially at first. Like you need to have the money to order the stuff. You need to, you know, order supplies to like package and ship the stuff out. Um, there's like a really big kind of uh, like some strategic and financial hurdles to like first starting to sell your own stuff. Um, so there's always going to be like some quantity limits for like m almost anything that you want to buy. You're never just going to be able to get like one or 10 of something. Um, or if you can, then it's going to be really, really expensive and you're not going to be able to make a lot of money selling it. So that's definitely something to consider before you start producing a bunch of your own things. But I would not think of it in terms of like, I'm never gonna make a pin or I'm never gonna make an edition of prints. I would think of it in terms of like, let me just make like two things right now and see how those go. Um, and just keep it really like manageable and within budget. I think that um, you just have to be like realistic about it. And then once those things sell, then hopefully you have a little bit more capital at your disposal so that you can like fill your closet with a bunch of products like mine. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so in terms of separating the two styles, yes, I think it's very, very important to um, have a clear distinction between any like two different areas that you're working in and uh, be able to like, to make sure that the client knows what to expect when they hire you. Um, so I've always like, you know, if someone asks for something in between my children's illustration and my realistic work, I say, no, absolutely not, because that could look like anything. Like, I don't know what they're picturing because these things are too different and I'm not actually interested in doing an overlap between them. I'm interested in the two distinct things. Um, so it was really important for me to develop that separate children's illustration style first. Um, and I didn't do any picture book work until I like had that style fairly figured out. Um, in terms of, uh, the process um, or like guidelines for when you're working on picture books. Um, I think that most of that is going to honestly be determined by you as an individual. I mean, you can do morbid stuff if you want. There are a couple of picture book illustrators that do do morbid stuff, um, but like that's part of their brand and it like makes sense for them. Um, so, and you can do really realistic stuff if you want but it's just like you'll get different types of picture book work than the type that I do. Um, 
I actually, uh, this is the last thing I'll say because I think we have to go, but um, I, with my first book, Adventures with Barefoot Critters, I did try to sneak in some morbid stuff. <laughs> um, I originally had like, there were like some like skulls hidden here and there and there was like, the, uh, the girl fox character was wearing like a fox fur scarf, <laughs> which I just think that that's really funny. <laughs> Um, my, uh, my editor was, like, unfortunately did notice <laughs> and, uh, and kind of questioned that. And, um, I, I believe that I convinced her to keep it. We just changed it to, like, brown fur <laughs> instead of red. So, I don't know. It, it also depends on the flexibility of, like, you know, finding the right art directors and the right editors that, like, understand your sense of humor or, like, the, your vision for what you want to make. But um, there, I don't think that there's really any hard and fast rules. Everybody, thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>